The calling came to me while I languished in my room, while I withered away my youth in jail cells and damp vital fields. It brought me to life out of captivity in a street scarred and tattooed place I called body. Until then, I waited silently, a deafening clamor in my head, voiceless to all around, hidden from America's eyes, a brown boy without a name. I would sing into a solitary tape recorder, music never to be heard. I would write my thoughts in scrambled English. I would take photos in my mind, plan out new parks, bushy green, concrete free, new places to play and think. Then it came, the calling. It brought me out of my room. It forced me to escape night captures in street prisons. It called me to war, to be writer, to be scientist, then march with the soldiers of change. It called me from the shadows, out of the wreckage of my barrio, from among those who did not exist. I waited all of 16 years for this time. Somehow, unexpected, I was called. That poem was first written when I was 16 years old and jailed during the Chicano moratorium against the Vietnam War. The date was August 29, 1970. Some 30,000 people took part in the largest anti-war protest in a community of color at the time. After several law enforcement agencies attacked a largely peaceful crowd, a riot ensued leading to millions of dollars in damage and the deaths of three persons, including Chicano journalist Ruben Salazar. Hundreds were arrested. I recall several of us being maced while handcuffed in an LA County Sheriff's bus. Others were beaten. This event changed the trajectory of that war because it proved that there was a community of color that was willing to stand up and not go to war. In many ways, this changed me. I went from uh, heroin using tired, sad, manipulative, broken down young man to someone with consciousness, active, a revolutionary writer, thinker, and organizer. It's important to know what changes people. How is this possible? When I was arrested, they had let go most of the people except for five cholos, Chicano gang members. With us, they put us in the murder's row of the Hall of Justice Jail in downtown Los Angeles. I had a cell next to Charles Manson. The first night I was there, two murders put a razor blade to my neck. I stood up to them, showing no fear, although I was scared to death. Deputies were threatening us with the killings of the riots. But charges were never filed. Deputies woke me up in the wee hours and one day released me with no word. The thing that I understand was that what helped us is that there were Chicano activists that were taking photos and film of a whole event, and they showed police beating and shooting people, including at the Silver Dollar Bar on Whitty Boulevard, where Salazar was killed. This allowed us to be free, but it did something else to me in particular because now I can never be a slave to the same thing that held me back before. These activists woke me up, made me believe. And you might ask, how is this possible? How can you change somebody? 
from that kind of person to somebody who's meaningful and impactful and positive. This is the journey from trauma to transformation. It's a journey that anyone can take. It's a journey that can work anywhere. I believe it will work for millions of young people, especially the most troubled, so they can go from violence, crime, and addictions to have centered and vibrant lives. To me, this is better than imprisoning them and putting them away and losing them and forgetting them and isolating them so that they're unheard, unseen. This is better than what we have in California where it takes... <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it's better than that. <laughs> this is better than what we have in California where it takes $40,000 a year to keep an inmate in our prison system and $2,500,000 a year to keep a juvenile behind bars. This is cheaper. This is more effective. It's about caring. Because I have learned a long time ago, tough on crime doesn't work. It's tougher to care. What good is it to sit in front of the TV set and complain about all the crime and all the youth getting lost and confused and then vote to put them all away? It's tougher to go out and talk to a young person, to hear their story, to mentor them, to guide them, to show them there's other ways to live. That's the journey that we all need to help everybody take. Trauma does not have to be debilitating. Does not have to be a slavery does not have to be the end of the world. Your own pains, whether based in society, your family, or community, does not have to hold you in such a way that you feel that you can't go anywhere, and either it's suicide, or it's addictions, or it's violence, or it's crime. There's other ways to go, and it takes the hearts and minds and the hearts and hands of our community to in come in, intervene, and help these young people live again. As we know, there's a saying that says it takes a village to raise a child. But sometimes we don't think about what's it's being suggested. That if we don't invite these young people to live out fully their lives, they will burn that village down. This is why it's time for everyone to step up. It's time for everyone to say, I will take a chance. This doesn't require billions of dollars. It requires just to care to show that we got skills, to show that we can guide, to show that we will step in these communities that nobody wants and hang in there, even when people call you out, even when they test you, even when they try. Why do young people test you? Because they don't think you're going to come back. Why should they invest in you emotionally when most adults aren't there? So they get rid of you right away, give you a hard time just to see you walk away if they'd seen hundreds of times in their lives. Don't be that person. Stand in there. Be that person that they can rely on and they can trust. Because I'm going to tell you something. Young people want meaningful, wonderful, respectful relationships with adults. They want that. They just can't seem to find it. So it's time for us to begin to create that in our communities to take young people from trauma to transformation. I want to now do a poem that I wrote against the demonization of a lot of our young people that happens in the media, that happens everywhere you walk, and it happens in our institutions, that happens in our courts, that happens in our politics. You know how many people have built a whole industry against putting our young people away, against finding ways to just forget about them. There's billions of dollars against our youth and hardly anything for our youth. We have to change that. Because as I said many times over and over again, it takes billions of dollars to keep us poor. Now it's time to bring out the richness that really exists in our hands and in our families. The richness of our spirit, the richness of what we're about, and the richness of what we can do as a community. So this poem is a poem I wrote about trying to stop this demonization. Piece by piece, they tear at you. 
peeling away layers of being, lying about who you are, speaking for your dreams. In the squalor of their eyes, you are an outlaw, dressing you in a jacket of lies, tailor-made steel. You fit the perfect picture. Take it off. Make your own mantle. Question the interrogators, interrogators. Eyeball the death in their gaze. Say you won't succumb. Say you won't believe them when they rename you. Say you won't accept their codes, their colors, their preacher morals. Here you have a way. Here you can sing victory. Here you are not a conquered race, perfected victim, the sun and face and the thunderstorm. Hands, minds, they are covering out a sanctuary. Use these weapons against them. Use your given gifts. They are not stone. So I just want to end by giving you at least five ways that people should go. And I hope this is helpful. One, as I tell young people, whatever you do, get help. Find a community, healthy, sustainable. If you can't find one, create one. Most communities are temporary. Some are long range. Some of them already exist. They're in churches, they're in AA, they're in social justice organizations, they're in culture centers, they're in schools, they're in therapy circles. They're already there. Two, find your art, find your passion. Try to live out the story that was written the day you were born. To live a meaningful life, the one that you were meant to live and not one that was imposed on you or one that you feel you have to do for others. Three, get spir a spiritual path. And the key to this is that spirit is open to many things. There's many ways to go. Spirit does not really care about the particulars of the form, the church, or the belief system. It cares in the essence. It cares in engaging you in how, what best speaks deeply and singularly to you. Three, find a cause bigger than yourself. That's vital, because you're not doing all this just for yourself. If a lot of the trauma comes from society, family, and community, then you have to complete a circle and give back to family, community, or society to change that world, a cause bigger than yourself, to help others, to make your life impactful for others to see and say, maybe I can do this. Even if you've been to prison, even if you've been uh, hurting people, even if you've been violent, even if you've been in a gang, even if you've been on drugs and alcohol, you can still turn it around and show people, I can change, so you can change as well. And fourth, learn to own your life. What happens with drugs and alcohol is we turn our lives over to others. And we don't have any for ourselves. Own it. Take responsibility. Responsibility, that kind of responsibility is liberating. And it's a kind of important liberating work that every one of us can do. So I hope you take this and be on this journey with me and our young people from trauma to transformation to truly revolutionary acts and truly revolutionary visions of the world the way it should and can be. Thank you all very much.